Welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally. If you missed our last episode about integrating art in the ELA classroom with Dr. Michelle Zoss, please go back and check it out. Our guest today is visiting us for the second time to discuss cybersecurity because it is Cybersecurity Month, or actually Cybersecurity Awareness, Awareness Month, right? Month. Awareness. He's a threat hunter and cybersecurity compliance specialist and co-founder of Site2, a data management and security company. He is a cybersecurity program director at Lackawanna hey. College. Well done. Oh, I said it. He's <laughs> also it. Yes, that was a big accomplishment. Woohoo. Lackawanna College. Lackawanna College. He is always good about reminding us to keep good cyber hygiene. Please welcome yes. to the Teachers Pep Rally our guest and friend, Mark Gonzalez. Yay! Welcome back. <laughs> welcome back. Sir. Thank you welcome so much for back. having me. Happy to be here. We are so excited to have you here. So you are back. It's been pretty much a year because here we are in October again, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. What's new? It sounded, I, you know, I, I said a college name there. That sounds new. Tell us, a, is it okay to tell us a little bit about it? It is. Yeah. If you don't, yeah. I mean, I'm joining the ranks of academia here with, with all yeah. of you. So it's, yeah, it's exciting. I am the new program director at Lackawanna College here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, college uh, exploration personally, as well as just part of the program. It's a really exciting environment to be in, uh, you know, helping the, the college just benefit the whole community locally uh, in cyber awareness, um, just raising the community from, you know, in a variety of different ways. So it's, it's new to me, it's exciting to me, and I'm happy to be a part of it. That's great. Yeah. And Fred, that's not too close, not too far away from you, I gather, right? No, not at all. I mean, that's right in the downtown area of Scranton, Pennsylvania. So that's uh, nearby here for up to 10 minutes from down the road from me, right? Um, for those that don't know where Scranton, Pennsylvania is, you must know the office television show, which I think is the other <laughs> claim to fame that we have. But I, I don't think they could have found a better fellow to lead up that effort because Mark and I have worked together. We've talked together and, you know, he was a guest last time. Right. But boy, what a, what a, what a, a I was going to use the word gem, but that's kind of odd. I mean, I think you're more of a superstar than a gem, you know. So oh. I think it's uh, I think it's going to be great to see how that help how you bring value to the program, which you already have, and then grow. Yeah, thanks. Which we I need. Got my five need spot that. for you later. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Venmo. <laughs> no, yeah, right. Exactly. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know, I got a little bit of taste of academia when I was working with you, and and uh, now I'm taking it to another level. So it's 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 great. And I imagine being in that environment, like you said, it's really exciting, but it's also got to be kind of challenging. I feel like even though even when we spoke last year and for years now, there's been a lot of things to be aware of with cybersecurity, but there, there appear to be more and more threats or we're hearing more about it or maybe we're more mindful about it. So do you mind telling us like what are three things that threaten our cybersecurity, like the top three we should be aware of? Yeah, I, I, I guess the number one thing would be this, uh, this trend of the Internet of Things. Um, it seems like we're trying to pump computers into dumb devices left and right. Um, you know, we took a dumb device, which was a, a phone, and we made it a, a smartphone mm -hmm. by putting a computer in it. We are now taking refrigerators, which were dumb devices, and we're putting computers in we're even putting computers in toasters so that you know when your toast is ready. Um, and this just trend towards putting, making mm -hmm. uh, dumb devices, smart devices all over the world is putting everything on the internet. And the more that is on the mm -hmm. internet, the more vulnerability points there are, the more attack vectors there are, more ways for others to attack us and us to be vulnerable. Um, there is a... Uh, cybersecurity theorist, professional. Um, his first name is Miko, and that's all I have to say. If you ever Google cybersecurity and Miko, you'll find out uh, all about him in some of these great videos. He, he professes that the internet of things, this trend that we're on right now, is kind of like the asbestos of the 21st century. Mm. Um, you know how like asbestos, when it first came out, is like this ingenious creation. It, you know, it was fire resistant, it was an insulation insulator, and everybody wanted to put asbestos into everything. And similarly, right now, we're putting computers into everything, and we're putting them all online. Cameras are online. Uh, you know, just about every type of device that you can imagine is being put online 
for what purpose? For because we're lazy and we want to have access to things. Um, and that laziness and that just pervasive trend to want to put things online, um, you know, some theorists are saying could be our downfall because we mm. just uh, are, are, are making too many things interconnected, interdependent, um, and reliant on computers. So that would say that that's number one. Wow, that's that was, a big one. <laughs> that is kind of right. a big one. And there's so many different tangents that we can go down on that one. We could save that for a whole separate podcast. Right. But um, the number two thing I would say that is a, a threat, and it's always been, is, is email. Email is kind of the largest threat surface for both business and personal. Um, in business, we use email for communication with clients, and it's a way for people anywhere in the world to, to contact us. Email is 90% of, of malware and uh, ransomware comes through email. Uh, successful breaches, 90% of them come through email. So email continues to be a big threat platform, especially for students, right? You know, we think about our kids. If you want to get onto social media, if you want to get on gaming, one of the first things that they ask you for is your email address. So you've got eight and nine-year-olds that are creating email accounts that really don't know the threats of email. And uh, they're, they're getting them. They're getting uh, bullied through email. They're getting offers through email. Uh, it, just recently with the pandemic, Email was the number one way that you were getting offers for financial assistance, both legitimate and illegitimate um, during the pandemic. And it was a very uh, easy way for people to get uh, exposed or you know, vulnerable to, to some kind of, of threat. Um, so email continues to be the, the second biggest threat. And then I'd say the, the number one threat is just simply awareness. Right? There's just not enough education to, uh, at work and uh, for our kids and for our families. Right, we, we think about, we tell our kids every day or as they grow up, uh, don't talk to strangers. But do we tell them not to do it online? Um, you know, we buy them perhaps a cell phone that's over $1,000, but we don't buy them $30 antivirus for that cell phone. <laughs> Uh, right, that's we we pro true. we provide all these like great toys and tools and technology, but do we teach them how to use it before they use it? It's just kind of like here, run run with this and don't bother me anymore. You know, instead of taking a more calculated approach on what are the threats with this device, it's not just the phone anymore. It's, it's a full fledged computer that can do more on this cell phone than a desktop computer could do just ten years ago, maybe even mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, so yeah. I would say awareness and education, especially in our youth, is, is a big threat or lack, lack thereof. I just want to say, this is why I, did I cut someone off? I'm sorry. No, good. <laughs> this is why I love TPR, because I learn all the time. <laughs> I mean, I'm loving this internet of things because I saw this refrigerator, right, being, being advertised. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. But it goes back to, you know, like the education and the awareness, like we, we, we've come to a point where you say computer or, or easy and we jump on things without having the full counsel of things without like really thinking it through. Right. I mean, I love how you said a thousand dollar phone and but won't get the thirty dollars worth of um, antivirus or spyware. Right. Like we, we, I think we just need to be more critical in thinking um, before we just jump all over things. And this dumb devices to smart devices, I just think is brilliant. <laughs> Won't be getting well, that fridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, You're I think that's, stick to that's the, the dumb problem, appliance, right? Letitia. <laughs> have, right. And I'm trying to tell you, we underestimate the dumb. <laughs> oh, right? Like everything doesn't have to be smart. <laughs> we need balance. Even in our technology, <laughs> we need balance. You, you know, you it's it's a it's a great point, Mark. You brought up a bunch of things in there. The IoT stuff is 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 a huge threat. And the other part that you just said, I think, is really interesting and, and ties in with the awareness. Is the this other misconception or this other idea that you have nothing to lose? So there's that's the thing that I encounter in my classroom a lot. I don't know if you if you've had that opportunity yet, but people are like, "Well, I'm not a I'm not a financial institution. I don't have." thousands of million or millions and dollars, millions of dollars in the bank. I don't have this. I don't, if they get into my system, what are they going to do to me? Yeah. And I think that's part of that other awareness piece that needs to change because there is a lot that you can lose 
just because you haven't lost anything yet doesn't mean you know it's it, it's it's a terrible thing to have something be lost and i don't know where we could take that i mean it's it's a tough thing to express because i see it every year with my freshmen as we talk about cybersecurity during this month cybersecurity mm-hmm. awareness month i'm always floored by the fact that they don't understand good password management even though they're doing cyber and stem in high schools i guess or they're doing digital literacy um we're just not kind of amping it up because it's too easy to create a, an account it's you just off and run you click 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 okay 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 and then like let it go and then we all do it but we don't understand what's on the back side of that mm-hmm. too bad we couldn't lift back a veil and show everybody <laughs> what's really on the back like side the of Oz, what's, what's right? working like out there because <laughs> it could be ugly um right, but, yeah. right. it's a great well, way like, about the awareness yeah, I mean, to your point about the clicking through, right, terms and conditions with a lot of these services that are out there, all of us just kind of click through them without reading them, and you don't know what they're doing when you download an app. Sometimes you look at the permissions that you grant an app when you download it onto your phone. It allows them to look at your address book, your phone book, your, your use your GPS wow. to see where you are at any given time. And these are things that you wouldn't expect from some of these apps, like a gaming app that is just, you know, checkers type thing. Well, why do they need to know all this about, about me personally? And you're signing off on it because you're, you're just, you want to get to that app. You want to get to that game. You want to, you know, use it for its intended purpose, but you don't realize all the information that they're collecting about you in the background that they could potentially, you know, sell to somebody else or even themselves use in some way against you. So it's, um, yeah, it's a it's a wild, wild, wild west out there it on the internet. It seems like the apps, Mark, you used to be able to kind of go through that because I used to like go through it with a fine tooth comb, but then it got to a point where they wouldn't let you say no to things. Like unless you said yes to it, Everything. you didn't get it on your phone. So that yeah. was kind of like, okay, now I got to decide, do I really want this app? Is it yeah. that important? Sometimes I decided no, but because it's that's become such a thing, it's kind of hard. There are things where I'm like, well, I really do use this app, so I need it. I had a thought too out there for any educators, like think hearing about the email and your district gives an email to students. I know in our district, the one that I work in, um, the kids do get a, a district email address, but they're not allowed to receive, they cannot see there's, I don't know if that's a firewall mark, I'm trying to use fancy cyber terms here, but there's some <laughs> kind of block where- Web filtering. You, yeah. filter, thank you. But you have that district email, you can't, they can't receive anything from them. So the, it saves it to basically their teachers only. Hmm. Great. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I think that the unfortunate part of it is that some school districts do a better job of that than others. Um, you know, there, there's, there's some that were forced last year, obviously, to haphazardly create some kind of work, you know, to school virtual schooling, online learning, and uh, didn't do it in the most secure fashion as possible. The good news is they've had some time to catch up, but um, there's still some stragglers and some gaps out there for sure. There always are. And I think those those challenges are going to continue because especially in our region, we're seeing the, the public school systems are being challenged by these cyber charters. Uh, not a bad way or a mm. nefarious way, but Parents are looking for alternatives. So school districts seem to be scaffolding or building infrastructure very quick. That's to that's to kind of competing against these, we'll call them companies, right? That are standing up charter schools and they already have the infrastructure. They're aware of all these issues. They're staffed, they're well-funded. And then all of a sudden now you're, the, the public school system is trying to, seem like, like you just said, they're trying to catch up and that's continuing to make this you know, unevenness for cybersecurity and also learning too. So it's, it's an interesting time in general for all this stuff, um, you know, yeah. and, the, and, the, and, the, and the educational apps that this, these kids are using or these publisher apps that these kids are using. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, something else too. Right? In the classroom, we have the opportunities to use the homegrown stuff, right? We have the stuff that's been purchased and vetted by the school district. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. a publisher comes along. We won't say who, but they'll be like, hey, check out our <laughs> online offerings. And then all of a sudden you're creating an account over on their space. And, you know, then you get into that whole other issue. Who's, who's responsible for what? Um, and, and so, you know, I, not to kind of jump topics a little bit, but I, I know Aaron and I talked about this. I was recently working with a school district out in the Midwest and they prompted me with a SOPA agreement. Um, I'm not sure. Are you, are you familiar with any of that, Mark, as far as rights, privacy and vetting the, um, the software? It, it, it's, it's relatively new. But I'm still, mm. and I was, I was, I, I'm still trying to come up to speed on it because I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to provide if I were to build something for them to use in their classroom. Kind of like but an acceptable use policy or yeah. 
yeah, exactly. St yeah. Uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, yeah, I mean that that's you know I guess it could be just a new term for kind of typical legal uh, you know protections against you know uh, ensuring that an application has been properly vetted. It's gone through proper um, security testing. There's so many you know innovation as great as it is, it sparks new challenges and new problems, right? And more, more often than not, when a company or any type of innovator brings a product to market, it's inherently flawed from the beginning. You know, there are going to be cybersecurity vulnerabilities. There's going to be weaknesses in its design <clears throat> just because the company wants to get it to market as quickly as possible and start getting a return on their investment, start getting some clients, start proving and getting feedback from, from customers on that product. Um, and so quite often you're cutting corners in order to get that product to market as quickly as possible. Um, we've seen that in software for business. We've seen that in, in games, you know, we've seen products go, uh, around this time of the year before the holidays, they try and get to market, uh, toys that now, again, to the point of trying to put technology and computers into toys, you know, the, I won't say some of these names of some of these toys, but they're very popular from popular cartoon characters to whatnot. And they put in them cameras or listening devices um, that are connected through Bluetooth and allow, are supp intentionally uh, supposed to allow the parent to be able to monitor their, their child's activity, but they don't realize that the Bluetooth can go for tens, if not hundreds of feet in range. And mm. anybody with a Bluetooth connection can connect to them. So the idea of innovation and bringing technology into a device just for the purpose of having a cool new feature can sometimes inherently have uh, dangers built, built right in. Um, you know, th this is one of the things that a product came out in Europe before GDPR, which is the pri new big privacy rule in Europe. And it, it now, in hindsight, broke just about every GDPR mm. rule around privacy um, wow. because, again, they were just rushing to get something to market in, in order to try to make some, some money on it and didn't think of the, of the cyber and privacy risks associated with it. Um, so some of those rules and okay, some of those okay. policies and standards, legal agreements definitely need to be in place beforehand. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Aaron is looking at me like, I, girl, I know you're about to bust. <laughs> And I was thinking I probably should give a warning. We are getting close to Halloween. I feel like between <laughs> cybersecurity awareness and a little bit of some spooky, you know, uh, hair raising uh, thoughts, this is this is well in alignment, this, Mark. Thank yes. you. Yes. I mean, I'm yes. having a conniption over here because uh, you're talking about this this fancy toy, and you know how the range is, whatever it is. I'm thinking, okay, you know, we all have registered sex offenders in our communities right which means that their bluetooth can access your kid's toy i mean this is just am i going down the wrong road Mark, here, is it that simple that well so so you know there there are it, it depends where some of these toys are manufactured okay. what the yeah. privacy rules and what the um you know things are in place but uh, i don't want to say the name of the toy but there was right. a toy that literally came out in 2015 that had all of these things that I just described and they had mm -hmm. a camera, it had a microphone and it was all connected through Bluetooth and there was no security. You didn't have a password that was required before you can connect to Bluetooth. There was no multi-factor authentication. You basically right. could get on this device as long as you were in range. My neck is and getting bad, Mark. <laughs> I'm making my neck go. Honey, neck. throw away the Teddy Ruxpin. And that, <laughs> and that toy is nowhere in the background here. So right. <laughs> no I don't see it there. Here. Right there. I don't see it there, but uh, oh. <laughs> if it's in your closet, throw it out. So yes. I'm right. sitting here thinking about you guys will not, you, you, you'll believe this because this is Aaron's brain. I'm like, okay, so we have a tag that legally has to go on a hairdryer to remind people <laughs> not to use it in the water right. do we have a tag like that that's mandated on these devices to let people know this is now a that, smart device here and that's dumb <laughs> with all this smartness that is dumb <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean that's that's uh, that's part of the challenges is that there isn't like a single governing body that rolls over all this stuff to all this innovation um when it comes to cybersecurity, especially, I mean, there are around business, you know, HIPAA for healthcare, there's regulations there, you know, FINRA for financial services, there are a lot of these more well-established industries, there are longstanding 
standards for how you do things. But when it comes to cybersecurity, you think about, for example, the iPhone, it's only been around 13 years, right? And so we're just kind of catching up on what it means to have all these computer enabled devices out there and these risks that are associated with them. Um, you know, it's funny, like even from the Department of Defense point of view, some of the things that they don't outlaw, they don't outlaw because if they outlaw them, they wouldn't be able to spy on our enemies, just like our enemies spy on us, right? Mm. If we outlaw them, we're kind of putting ourselves at a disadvantage right. um, because they're available all over the world. The tools that, and everybody knows about them, the tools for spyware, for monitoring network trafficking, for trying to decrypt a password. I mean, they're all used by every government in the world. So mm -hmm. if we outlaw it, then we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage when other countries haven't outlawed it. So some of these things are, issues way beyond all of our pay grades, but um, are, are the things that the world is living with these days. Yeah, and I think just to kind of round out that thought, so our listeners are kind of tracking it in general, is it, the question probably comes up in your head saying, well, why can't we make these things more secure? Part of the challenge is that when you buy something out of the box and it's all locked down and secure, it becomes very difficult to connect it to your network or to your other devices. So that's, so right. picture like a wall when you, you buy this, this device, you bring it to your house and it has a wall inside of it. So that wall is really low. And then you're, you're allowed, if you kind of learn, to start applying the wall to be higher or build the wall higher by adding security features. And then, because once you connected it, that's really part of the problem is that the stuff has such a low bar entry for, mm. for home use. You know, like I was just listening to, the, on, to a local uh, weatherman talk about how excited he was about having a thermostat that he can now monitor from his phone. The first thought that popped in my head was, why is he doing that? Why do you need to know your, your house's thermostat on an app, you know, three miles, 30 miles away? I mean, it, that's why you have schedulers in your, your app or your phone in your house. You could set them and go. Uh, so it goes back to that initial thought you had is like, we have to ask some questions like, what value do the, does this add? Are mm -hmm. we really saving so much time by having all this stuff connected. Yeah, because the value is greater than the risk. And in right, most cases, right. in most cases, it's know. not. It's very yeah. cool. Don't get me wrong, but it's right. like. I mean, that's why they're doing it. They're putting it in for the cool factor, for the innovative features, and, and people are, are jumping at them. But ultimately, oh the risk God. that it's presenting is way up, greatly outweighs the value or the and efficiency. And just to build on your analogy there, you know, Fred, you know, I like to think of it not as just one wall, but as multiple, multiple walls, mm. multiple, multiple layers of defense, you know, kind of think of the old castles that they used to build in, in medieval times. You'd have, you'd have a moat, you'd have a wall, you'd have, if somebody even got past the moat and the wall, then you had interior walls where the king and queen would hide or where they had their gold in the dungeon. You know, you had to get through multiple, multiple layers before you could get to that gold, to those riches, or even to, again, to the king or queen. Um, it's the same type of thing mm. with a PC that you buy. It has hundreds of layers of security built into it, but who would use it if the first thing that you have to do is get through all those layers of security before you can use it? So by design, they make it as easy to use as possible, but that makes it less secure. Um, and for toys, you know, back to back to the toy conversation. <laughs> If they were to put all those things in and your five-year-old opens up the box and it says, please enter your password, please enter your multi-factor authentication password, please do. I mean, the kid would like throw it out the door as soon as right, they got right. it. So, um, you know, it, there's those challenges of bringing cool stuff to market. Which is why education is so important and awareness, right? Because to me, even now, cybersecurity, I think of the Pentagon for some reason. You know, my brain goes there and, and, you know, you don't really realize that the Pentagon is really in your home and it's in this toy, which I'm now fixated on. Now I'm thinking about the, the thermometers that I got from Mr. Jones's grilling that's connected to his phone. Are we threatened when our meat is cooking? I mean, this is just too much for me. You know, what I went to in my head was, you know, you're saying the everyday consumer wants that cool right. new device. But now I'm thinking school districts because that's what's nice in the paper. That's what's nice in the, in the, in the public relations me, uh, um, mm -hmm. arena. Look at this technology we're providing our students. And I know some districts, some very well, they'll buy stuff, but then there's not the infrastructure for the upkeep to keep it safe, mm 
to keep it up to date. You know, they have tech people, maybe one tech person between four schools and they travel and, you know, you have to put in a work order to get them coming all. It's scary stuff, Mark. It's, uh, it's scary yeah. stuff. Can you well, have- and, and we've been limiting our, our viewpoint so far right? Um, in the sense that, you know, so if you take this whole idea that everything is getting on the internet, what, what kind of things are getting on the internet? Right. Life-sustaining things. You know, things from pacemakers to yes. just hospital systems. Um, you know, you have monitoring devices now for people with diabetes just right into their arm that connects to their phone. Um, you have just about anything that has a digital footprint. And, you know, we we had something happen recently with a fuel pipeline, right? Fortunately, it happened in the summer. When, instead of the winter. Can you imagine if that had happened in the middle of the winter and people's homes couldn't be heated mm. yes. um, or cars driven? We had a recent issue with a food manufacturing plant where that was shut down. Well, so you had all this raw fruit, food, mm. meat on a production line that just suddenly comes to a halt. Um, hopefully they didn't still package that if it was no longer, you know, properly, you know, because then now you talk about, again, a, a threat to life if you're going to have to be uh, spreading around chicken with salmonella on it because it's been laying out on the for a while. Episode. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that this could affect our lives from a life-sustaining point of view, but we won't get into that because I really don't want to get Leticia to have a, you know, Mark, a total meltdown on me. the... Can we go back to <laughs> Sorry, the diabetes Leticia. monitor? Leticia, yes. This monitor for my diabetes. I'm just going to be transparent. It's been in my closet for the longest. So I have this okay. put in my arm, you know, the phone. And I just don't need another excuse not to use it. <laughs> <laughs> now you, right. However, Great. What have I done? Your right, doctor's what have you done? My me. doctor's not going to be happy with you. Um, <laughs> so do you think I should use the actual monitor that comes with the device and not my phone? Because it comes with its own little. This this is beyond my pay grade. I'm just I'm I'm sharing with you the vulnerabilities and the risks. You have to make your own calculated decision. I mean, you so do you have antivirus political. on your phone? I love this. <laughs> so I still do not. Have you not my learned hygiene, anything in the past year? My hygiene stinks. Well, I am. Uh, <laughs> my hygiene stinks. Um, I am, I do have all of my passwords in an organized place. Okay. And I change them regularly, which is good. Good. That is very good. And don't use the same that. one on this on multiple apps, right? Correct. That's good. yes. That's why I have it organized. Um, Beautiful. So that one, that, two, that, three, that, four, four, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> Pass I hope they're a little Freedom more Matata. complicated than that. They better not be Leticia one, two, three. Oh my god. That's oh boy. <laughs> now, <laughs> I go Sorry, now I gotta go change everything. <laughs> All right, so before, because I really want to get to some solutions. Here. Yes, before, let's get let, to solutions. Well, I'll oh, I got nothing. My <laughs> <laughs> I got, nothing. What are some simple things, just little baby steps that we can do at home or that we can help our kids at school to do to try to be a little bit better with our cybersecurity? Yeah, I, I mean, so we talked a little bit about awareness, right? Having that family conversation about this high-tech device that... Uh, that they're using and, and what it what can happen through there, you know, whether it be ranging from bullying, uh, again, gaming. This is something that I think in general kids think is so innocent. You, you used to play in the street with your friends, kickball, whatever it was. Now you've taken that model and you're doing it on the computer. You're meeting mm-hmm. kids online, kids, we assume, we don't know, in these gaming environments. And the natural tendency is as you play longer and longer with them, you get more comfortable, more friendly. The next thing you get an invitation to a discord mm-hmm. channel to talk a little bit more beyond gaming. Hey, let's talk about gaming offline, blah, blah, blah. Next thing. Hey, why don't we get together? Um, you know, those are the types of vulnerabilities that come in that kids probably innocently wouldn't mm-hmm. think it could go down that path, but we need to raise their awareness to, to things like that. Um, how cyber, social media, gaming today has transformed how you meet people and whether they're mm-hmm. truly the kid at school, the neighborhood kid, or, or something more sinister. So that's you know, one. Go ahead, Fred. No, I was going to say, like, so that I was just taking a quick peek at something. Are you aware of any inroads in terms of 
privacy or, you know, like obviously we're seeing a, a big discussion and a big out pouring of attention towards the Facebook files mm-hmm. that have, you know, recently uncovered that there's been some algorithms mis, you know, misaligned. Mm-hmm. Um, but also like, are you seeing anything, you know, hearing you say that, are you seeing anything that's going to help protect the consumer? Is there anything evolving recently? Not that I'm aware of, you know, I spend a lot, most of my time in the corporate space. So often, you know, I don't pay as much attention to the consumer space, but uh, boy, I, I hope so, you know, cause there's just, so much evolving and so many possibilities out there that could expose our youth to, to, you know, to, to risks that we certainly hope that they wouldn't. Because they, they, you know, they talk, there's been discussions around Instagram, right? There was going to be Instagram for kids and all of a sudden that got pulled back. And then now all of a sudden we get into the Facebook thing and now there's some discussion revolving around tiered access by age group. And yeah. you know, so that the eight to 10 year olds, which probably shouldn't be on social media, right? Period. Um, yeah. And then, and then you kind of swing the pendulum all the way to the right and you look at, you know, not that we want to be like a, a communist government, but you look at certain governments in the world like China who are now saying children can only spend three hours a week mm. playing video games. Um, yeah. You know, you, I know that we don't want to go in that direction, but I'm sure there's some parents right now who are listening to this going, I think that's a great idea, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, I kind of wonder that that game, that video game scenario that you just, you know, put out there, I mean, yeah, you don't know how old that person is. There, there's no clear stopgap measures that can help. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is uh, clear. Police you know, it or, yeah. Police it, right? Or if, so if I'm going to be, uh, if I'm going to go out and buy a game console and I'm going to buy this game and I'm 35 years old and I'm a pedophile, I can hop on and be a 12-year-old. You know, there's yeah. nothing that can easily mm-hmm. barrier that right now. Uh, yeah. that, 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 not that I'm so aware many. of. If, any, if anybody knows, I'd love to hear it in the comments for the podcast what happened with so much of so many of us being home for so long we got comfortable with the amount of time we were on these devices we're dealing this with our son right now it's like we're pulling back we're limiting more and there's a bit of a push on that well this is how it was well no it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be like that all the time what's normal now it has been accelerated just even since we talked to mark last um, all right mark i i would love to throw up something um you know so many school systems sent home devices to to families that needed them um now they're coming back in different conditions and if hopefully they're coming back i have a teacher (laughs) friend of mine that uh you know her whole ipad cabinet sent out a lot of them came back supposedly white she opened it up and she saw some pretty nasty stuff on Mm. that machine something that a district thought was white that she had the okay to give to her class and start working on. But that history and that search engine, not good, not good. So that's something I think everybody, let's not be comfortable. Let's stay, right. stay, stay a little bit alert, you know, for, for our kiddos. Mark, I'm going to jump to a question we have here. Uh, if you were talking to my class at elementary school or, um, you know, we're all represent middle school, high school, what would you say to a group of elementary students? What would you say to a group of middle? What would you say to a group of high? Would it be the same thing to each group or a little bit different? If you had just one statement to say to them on the way out, drop the mic, what would be that, that thing that you would be telling wow. them? That's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I think it would be just be aware, right? Be, you can kind of tell your kids to be aware of their surroundings when they're walking through neighborhoods and things along those lines. Uh, just, just be aware. Don't, don't assume that somebody online is your friend, that they have the best in- intentions. Um, it is so easy online to connect with someone anywhere in the world. Um, and, and that may be the, the best message in, in general for really anyone to remember is that the internet makes the world a very small place. It used to be that if someone wanted to break into your house, they literally had to get in a car or on a plane or at least walk to your house, check the door to see if it's locked, um, peek through a window. They don't have to do that anymore with the internet. You can be clear across the world and knock on your door and open the door to your computer without you know, you having to unlock it for them um, via email, via social media chats, via gaming, 
all of those are platforms where anybody in the world can inter interact with your child, with you, with very little betting. Um, so I, go ahead. Fred. If I could, Mark, and maybe maybe to clarify something, what you've said it now several times, and that is that that email is the largest surface threat. I understand that, um, but maybe explain to our listeners. What is that in the, what are you talking about? Are you talking about double-clicking an attachment? Are you talking about something else in the email? Maybe just clarify that a little. Yeah, everything from, so the point of the layer defenses that Fred and I were talking about before, you can create a firewall, you, you can have the moat, you can have the, the, the huge wall, you can have all these layered defenses. Email in many organizations circumvents all of those. It just goes right from the sender to the recipient. Um, and what can be in that email? There can be an invitation. It could be phishing. You know, it could be, hey, um, send me money because I'm the controller of the company, but it's really not the controller of the company. So just purely the contents of that email can be deceiving. It could be trying to get you to do something that you shouldn't do. Um, and ultimately, you should be verifying that that email came from the person that it says it is, you know, whether it be for via phone call or some kind of follow-up, get up from your desk and walk down the hallway. Hey, Mr. CFO, did you really just send me this email to, to wire transfer $15,000 to our client and in, in across the ocean? Um, so there's that part of it, just purely what could be in the email to deceive you and the content. Then there could actually be an attachment with a virus in it. So in any kind of executable, a PDF, if you execute that attachment or download it onto your computer, it will then potentially run malware, ransomware on your computer. Depending on your permissions, both on your computer and at your corporate network or even at your home, it will go wherever you have permission. So imagine the president of a company who has access to every file in the company or a network administrator who grants permissions to other employees to be able to get onto the network. These are what we call super users, um, admins, people with elevated privileges. If that ransomware gets onto one of their computers, it will go everywhere in the company. Mm. Um, so there's that risk as well. There's the risk that a link in that email will take you to a website that has, again, deceiving content. We've seen the, instead of Bank of America links, the Bank O America, missing the letter F. There are literally websites created like that with typos in them to deceive people. And once you get to that website, you think you're going to your banking site and you're really not. You enter your username and password and now they have your username and password. All of this, you know, and this is the short list so far of things that can come to you via email. Mm -hmm. Propositions to your kids, scams to say, hey, you know, you just didn't get your, um, your, your, money for uh, COVID money, uh, your check, that's because we didn't get your proper bank account. Send us your bank account and we'll get the, the right check to you right away. Um, you're in desperate financial case situation. Want a $20,000 loan? We'll give it to you with no questions asked. I mean, the offers are endless right now because of the pandemic, because of financial circumstances, because we're all at home. Uh, all of that can come to you via email without you asking. It's the worst. You, you know, you go out to your mailbox every day and you get junk mm -hmm. mail in your mailbox. This is junk mail on steroids um, yeah, and far worse, obviously. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, like, so parents or teachers might be listening to this wondering about, you know, where does this all go? Where, so this is the things you want to also pay attention to, right? So not that long ago, two weeks ago, Twitch gets hacked. So what is Twitch? Twitch is the gaming platform stream. It's a streaming for uh, gamers, right? Most of them are young people. I have, you know, we know 13, 14 year olds that are on Twitch and they're streaming. So now their password has been acquired. So I won't be surprised in what, four months maybe, we'll start to see new ransomware emails come out. And in the subject line will be their Twitch password. And then that'll be in the body of that email will be, hey, I know what you did on that webcam. Uh, here's proof that I saw you. Here's your password. And if they didn't go in and change their Twitch password since this last hack, they will then fall into that psychological prey mode, right? Oh my gosh, even though you didn't do anything, or maybe you did, you should have been doing, going to those sites that kind of Pete was alluding to, all of a sudden now they're gonna react. And now they're paying, they have to figure out what do they do? Do they tell their parents? Do they tell their teacher? So that's, that's, the, that's the other side. That, that goes back to that awareness thing. That's where when people hear that their data has been hacked by a vendor, so a vendor's data has been pilfered, 
and you have your account in there, you need to find out because you need to change your email, you need, or not your email, but you need to change your password immediately. And that goes back to password management too, which is very important. Not just one yeah. password for everything though. We won't say right. It. And multi-factor, multi-factor authentication too. Exactly. You know, the one, even if you do have that scenario that you just described where a password gets stolen, breached, used against you, if you have a second factor of authentication, you know, the pin that comes to your phone or the email mm-hmm. or the phone call to verify that it's truly you, you have that added layer of defense to make sure that it's truly you logging in. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, the scenario just described with Twitch happened with Yahoo about eight, 17 years ago. And uh, those emails came out, sure enough, actually, they were more patient. I think it took like 10 years before they started sending out those emails. But I know a lot of people who fell for it. A lot of people who called, you know, my company asking, what should I do? What should I do? They, they know what I did. And I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> I mean, never mind, never mind. I, I didn't do anything, but they have my password. <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh. So yes, yes. That is a very, another viable scenario that good preys tip. on. It's a, good, it's a good reminder that you just shared though, like what Pete was asking about what could students do and teachers be doing. That's, that's just such a great, it is a simple message though. I mean, and it applies to so many grade levels. You can, mm-hmm. you can ramp up the examples, I guess, as you go across your group to your group, you know, making them a little bit more intense and attention mm-hmm. getting, but it is the same message. Yeah. Fisher, cool. were you going to say something? I want to make sure I don't cut you off. No, I'm good, honey. You know, I'm processing. <laughs> you, you and me both. Pro- That's a good pun, by the way. Processing. Processing. Mark, so I'm sitting here thinking about uh, you're you're a smarty pants. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that. I mean that in a nice way. You you, you know a lot about cybersecurity, and we are so thankful that you come and talk to our audience every year to make sure that we are aware, because that's what you said. Be aware, and then yes. you always give us some some good tips for good cyber hygiene. So I have a question for you. Do mm. you have a teacher, a coach, or a mentor, or someone growing up that you? Um, want to give a shout out to that maybe sparked this love of of technology or just, you know, someone you looked up to. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously my parents, right. They wanted me to make sure that I followed what I was passionate about and, and, Mm. and it was technology, you know, might've started innocently in gaming and things along those lines as well. I had my Apple IIe when I first started (laughs) and simple technology that eventually grew into, you know, pursuing in college computer information systems and then eventually cybersecurity. So Definitely, definitely my parents, thankful for that, for them guiding me down the right path. That's a good yes. one, because you seem like, you know, when I feel like when your your work doesn't feel like work and you feel passionate about it, then you're in a good spot. And you, you that seems like a good description for you. So I'm happy to yeah, hear Yeah, thank so you. We're at the takeaway series, right? At the takeaway part. So we're going to go, <laughs> Mark, to each person on TPR. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have so many notes. I've got to narrow this down. So a takeaway, some kind of spark or idea or something, you know, that, that you're going to walk away with after this conversation. And then Mark will bring it back to you as our guest for the last word. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Okay. So I think I'm going to go with Pete today first. Mm, mm. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking of movies. <laughs> so in the eighties, you know, we have war games. Right, right. Great in the 90s, little Sandra Bullock, we had the net. Things got a little bit more darker, a little bit more sinister, yeah. a little bit on, more on the personal level. And then in the last couple of weeks, my son introduced me to this hit movie on Netflix. Uh, Squid the Game? Mitchells versus Squid. the Machines. Oh, oh okay. And <laughs> it was great. But it, it's this uh, internet of things that you're talking about. This oh so tangled web we, we we've li- woven. I can't even talk too many W's, Elmer Fudd. But um, just <laughs> such, it's scary stuff. Mm-hmm. I I never heard that term before. I was I always think of like the web, how everything's connected, and I you know I associate that word with not the most positive things, web. But <laughs> I, I I just that that's my takeaway is the IOTs, as Fred said, the Internet of Things. It made me think of this movie. Um, the Mitchells and the Machines. So um, check it out. That went up. I didn't even hear about that. That's a yeah, really I didn't good one. I was, I was, yeah, I was with Letitia. I was going Squid Game. So, <laughs> so wait, I I mean, that's what I said. Squid Game. Uh, <laughs> side note: uh, the Mickey and Minnie series on Disney Plus used to be on Disney Channel too. Uh, the little, real quick, little ones are like maybe right. ten minutes long. They do one where they go to a smart house. 
and they think, oh, this is so great. And it turns into horror. So mm. if you want something that's a little more G rated, but still, you know, gets the point across, especially those little ones, check out the Mickey mini episode of the smart house. Mm. Letitia. And you watch that, which is hilarious to me. Of course, <laughs> of course. So I think my takeaway, I immediately wrote down when we said that Mark was a threat hunter, mm. which I think is an awesome phrase. I think we all need to become threat hunter hunters. And does the benefit outweigh the threat? I mean, I think that that question is so critical for just your everyday consumer, right? Like that toy really has me, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, we laugh about it, but you know, that's really serious. And so I think that we become empowered when we kind of become our own threat hunters and just really start being a little more thoughtful and asking ourselves the question, is it worth it? Right? Yeah. Is the threat worth the benefit? So hmm. thank you, Threat Hunter. I'm 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 uh-huh. seeing a whole uh a whole series here, you know, like the, the bounty hunter. hunter, you know, <laughs> like the bounty hunter, but a little bit more polished. Yeah, we can do it. Not the leather vest. We got yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I saw Mark in a leather vest, that'd be cutoffs. awesome. <laughs> Fred, baby. And no undershirt. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Fredo, you're That's awesome. awesome. I, I love what you just said, Letitia, because I, I, and Pete, you, you, were, the message is I think going to be a continuum here. Um, when I was taking my take, when my takeaways down, um, I, I circled awareness, so it kind of comes back to that. Mm-hmm. But I think also I want to caveat that a little bit with um, something else you just said, Letitia, and that's you know being the threat hunter and so on. For for all of us to become threat hunters, we have to become armed, mm-hmm. and in order to become armed. Mark is an example of a resource and yes. there are resources all across the country right now at your local colleges and, and maybe some organizations that, that a school district can easily reach out to, mm-hmm. to bring in a guest speaker, to bring in, yes. um, you know, some educational pieces that maybe they're not comfortable covering because it's outside of their skill set, or, or the tech guy is, or the tech woman is too overwhelmed with, you know, covering the, the school stuff. So bring somebody in mm-hmm. so you can arm people because I don't think we want to operate from a standpoint of fear, but that's really where this can go to real quick. Mm-hmm. And the only way you could battle fear is through education, um, you know, being informed. And then I, I, something else I think we're all saying is that just be informed so you can make better decisions. I think that's what we all want to be. Um, like as parents, as teachers, we, we know that there's value in these tools to a certain extent, but I think you ask another great question and that is, what are you going to use it for? So mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's something that's so, so empowering going back to what Letitia just said, but, uh, yeah, seek the resources in your local community to kind of bolster that, that knowledge. So you can be a threat hunter and not be a subject of the threat. Right, right. <laughs> that's a good point, Fred. And I'm even thinking, you know, um, empower your students, no matter what level, create clubs, let them yeah. be the ones that that teach the the school about these things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you couldn't get a better uh, advocate than than the kids, the students, the young adults to do it. So I've got two things. My first one is when you were talking, Mark, about Miko with the Internet of Things and the saying of this that this is the asbestos of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. That is just yeah. really. Yeah, when you explained it like that, I thought, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that sounds about right. We need to be careful. And because of that, I'm also thinking, what are some ways in our schools that we could, you know, we, we use a lot of times themes or real world connections and different, different things. So I'm thinking in our lesson plans, like try to incorporate ways to, to make these connections. We're seeing it like um, Pete just said in, in Netflix series. So the interest mm-hmm. is there but it needs to be really kind of consistent. So I was thinking about a couple of things. Letitia said, she likes the idea of a threat hunter. So I'm thinking like little kids, you know, in a classroom before every time they get out an iPad or something to take their eye ready or a diagnostic or do some research, I, I would have a badge that says threat hunter and have them do like some kind of checklist or something to, you know, to mm-hmm. ensure safety, right? So create um, threat hunters. Um, secondary, I think I brought this up maybe the last time, Mark, you were here, secondary, even college, Frankenstein, uh, is such the classic. I mean, the whole essence of that book is building a monster, building, creating something <laughs> that doesn't exist and then abandoning it once you've made it because it scares you. And, and there were a lot of times, Mark, you were talking about, Hey, you know, even the iPhone, it, 
it's only been 13 years and we didn't really, as we keep mm-hmm. expanding and growing in it, we didn't really think about what was, what was going to come for it. So, you know, just wow. think about that or math. I was thinking about, you could create word problems, like a scenario of, of a kid. And, and when they figured out the percentage of how often they'll get hacked, if they're doing this, that, or the other, <laughs> right. Um, you know, so it just, you know, teachers have fun with it, create some really neat lesson plans to try to make those connections to help them be aware. Sometimes that's, I think, more beneficial than standing there and just saying, be aware, don't do this, right? But them actually kind of thinking it through. Stranger danger type of thing. That's right. Which is good, but a little bit more. Yeah. A step further. How about you, I've seen uh, the use of escape rooms a lot in teaching Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's that's a popular way to take a subject that's difficult or, or maybe... Know whether it's hard to comprehend or just a subject mm-hmm. that kids may not like right. to bring, bring it into a different context. So that, okay. that might be a way as well. Interesting. Um, so am, am I up now? You're up, Mark. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think I said this last time, and I, it, I don't think, you know, it, it uh, I think this would be my parting word regardless, and that is cybersecurity is a team sport. Mm. Right. There's this popular saying that I, you know, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And in the cybersecurity world, right, mm. a lot of people use that that uh, line of thinking. I just have to be a little bit better than the next guy because then let them get <laughs> hacked, um, and and I won't get hacked. Um, but but really, you know, and this is one of the things that we're embracing at. at at Lackawanna College and just in general, uh, one of the things that the NSA is preaching Department of Homeland Security is that we're all on the same team, mm-hmm. right? And we're only as good as our weakest link. So if, if we have, for example, a football team that walks out onto the field locked arm in arm and they all know the same playbook and they all know how to defend the goal line the same way, then they're going to be better than a team who doesn't, who's not on the same playbook. Oh, my, my dogs are saying goodbye. Oh, okay. Um, okay what, what is that? <laughs> I've been hacked. <laughs> right. Who let the dogs out? Sorry. <laughs> I thought they turned the mic up the audience here for a second. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that's the, I think that that is a message that needs to be conveyed. You know, if you are great at maybe cybersecurity or you're great at math or you're great at what you, you should be spreading that knowledge. But it's so much more important these days with cybersecurity when it can be a matter of life or death, when it can mean the difference between healthcare systems being up and running, our food supplies being tainted or not, our you know, houses being warmed in the middle of winter or not, that we're all looking out for each other mm-hmm. and spreading that awareness and making sure that we're, uh, we're on the same team and we're all in a, a more aware on a database, d- daily basis. We're all practicing good cyber hygiene. Yeah, that's perfect. There awesome. And Mark, where can our audience connect with you if they want to reach out? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not on a lot of social media for all the reasons we talked about earlier, right. <laughs> but I am on LinkedIn. You can find me there, you know, Mark Gonzalez, and you can search on site two, uh, my company or Lackawanna College, and you should find me. Great. And uh, the other thing is, I was going to say, you are on our episode number nine. So mm-hmm. Mark Gonzalez, if you're loving what you're hearing, and I know you will go back and listen to episode nine and <laughs> treasure uh, the first hint of we need to have better cyber hygiene. Hey, Pete, where can our TPR audience find us? I'm nervous about saying it right now, but okay. <laughs> Teacher, we're, we're, we're a safe place. Does, does saying it quietly help? <laughs> all I know is if there's a if there's a bear behind Fred and I, I'm taking out his knee. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I know. Uh, we're looking at each other, even though we can't see each other. We're both looking at each other at the same time when he said I'm that. So, I'm going to go up to you next time I see you say, that bear's coming. All right, anyway, all right. So, uh, hey, teacherpeprally.com, Facebook group. We'd love to hear from you. And then our hotline, 678-439-TPR1. Give us a call. Let us know what you think about tonight's program. We love hearing from you. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for coming again. Hopefully we can make this a yearly thing. Because cool. uh, be I always walk away with something that I need to make sure I take care of. Yes. Great. Excellent. Excellent. That's, all, that's all we ask for, right? A little bit more awareness. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Oh, thanks, Mark. Walk Thank away you. with an ulcer. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get the recording. There. I'm great at parties. <laughs> Eric yeah, killed the recording. That is awesome. Is it still going, Eric? I still have it recording still. Nope, it won't go off. <laughs> That's okay. I-
Totally lose the buttons. Can't do anything. That's, it's frozen again. Oh, thank that you, Mark. Is hilarious. Yeah, Aaron, thank did you, you Mark. do? Have you updated? Uh, yeah, Zoom? I have, and the buttons are all there, and the live transcript <laughs> and everything. And then the minute I hit record, everything disappears, but the all of you in the little squares. There's a major forced update coming this week or the end of this Great. week, and on Zoom. Yeah, there's a some kind of patch that's got it. They're forcing it, and if you don't do it. Zoom's not going to work. So Good. just as a, a I, I need the patch because. <laughs> nice. <laughs> not good. All Mark, right. Well, well that... I hate, hate to be abrupt, but I don't want to keep this on if it's still recording. <laughs> <It's> correct. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Mark, night, can you, can, can, Mark, can, can you get on a call now or are you, are you busy? Yeah, yeah sure. I'll call you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.